uh, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet, I'm Luis Fraga, the director of our Institute for Latino Studies and professor of political science. And on behalf of the Institute for Latino Studies and our co-sponsors, the Indiana Latino Bar Association, the American Constitution Society, not Constitutionalist Society, right. but Constitution Society, and the Notre Dame Hispanic Law Student Association. Welcome to our last of this year's transformative Latino leadership of lectures. We are very fortunate this afternoon to have a leading thinker and a leading advocate in a number of different areas, Professor Michael A. Olivas, the William B. Bates Distinguished, holding the William B. Bates Distinguished Chair in Law at the uh, University of Houston Law Center, also the Director of the Institute for Higher Education Law and Governance at uh, the University of Houston. Professor Olivas um, received his uh, bachelor's degree from the Pontifical College Josephinum uh, College in Ohio. I learned today, um, when we say pontifical, it has special meaning here at Notre Dame. You should all laugh, that's kind of a joke. Um, they, a Master of Arts and PhD in Education from Ohio State University, and the, a Juris Doctor degree from Georgetown University. He is a highly educated person. He has published 15 books and over 180 articles. Uh, among the books that he has published are the Dilemma of Access, Latino College Students, Prepaid College Tuition Programs, The Law in Higher Education, uh, which I believe is a case book, mm -hmm. um, the first case book ever written on higher education law in the United States, um, as well as- Available in fine bookstores yes, every time. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who have earlier editions, there's a new edition we heard earlier today <laughs> that is, that is uh, being done. Um, and um, he has a, a forthcoming book with New York University Press that is the title of his talk of, um, uh, with, us, with us today. In addition to all of his academic accomplishments, um, Professor Olivas has served on the editorial board of more than 20 scholarly journals. In 2010, he was chosen as the Outstanding Immigration Professor of the Year by the National Immigration Professors Blog Group. In 2011, he served as president of the American Association of Law Schools, and in 2018, he received their triennial award for lifetime service to legal education and the law. He has served in a distinguished capacity in many law-related associations, too many for me to mention here. He's been a visiting professor at a number of law schools um, as well. Um, he's been a trustee of the college board. Anybody here take the, a the SAT or the LSAT, he's responsible. Um, he oversaw those, those, um, those functions. He has served for how many years now on the board of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund? Um, many a, years. A lot, a yeah, a lot of yeah. years. Over yeah. 10 years. Oh, about 20. Uh, since 2002. I'm reading what it says here. And most importantly, he has a regular radio show in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, on the National Public Radio there. Um, and the title of his show is The Law of Rock and Roll, um, where he <laughs> teaches about a passion of his, which is law related to rock and roll, contracts, musicians, music, and so forth, in addition to his incredible work in higher education law and immigration. Um, I uh, first met uh, Professor Olivas and his ex equally accomplished partner, um, Agustina Reyes, who is here, Professor of Education and Leadership Studies at the University of Houston as well, um, in the early 1980s, I believe, um, when I was still uh, finishing my graduate education, and it was apparent then that both of them were going to be extremely influential in the areas in their areas of work and study. I consider Michael a friend. He certainly is someone that I have called on a number of occasions uh, for advice. Um, about how to um, think through issues associated with immigration and especially our dreamer students. The title of his talk today is Her Chance to Dream, A Legal and Political History of the Dream Act and DACA. 
please give a warm Notre Dame welcome to Professor Michael Lewis. By the way, that thing with your parole officer will work it out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, thank all of you for being here. I know it's late in the semester. It's cold outside. We left 80 degrees in Houston. Um, but you are uh, actually seeing uh, uh, what I hadn't really considered at the time, but uh, is my last public appearance as a law professor because I'll be retiring uh, in, in May, um, like my friend John Robinson, Robinson in the back, and um, um, I will be returning uh, to Santa Fe, New Mexico with, with Tina, the woman I love, and we'll live out the years that are still available to us, um, both writing and, and being with our, our nieces and nephews and attending concerts. So uh, we, we have excellent plans and we're very, very pleased with this as it happens after 38 years of law teaching is my last public event. And so and I'm, I'm delighted to have it here because um, uh, much of my life, particularly my early life, revolved around my being Catholic. I studied to be a Catholic priest for eight years. Uh, and it turned out I was much better at afflicting the comfortable than I ever was at comforting the afflicted. And so <laughs> I, I left. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, not a moment too soon, uh, I, I left. And, uh, uh, and, and and as a, but it, it, I, I consider myself still a uh, both a practicing but also a cultural Catholic, and um, I'm also one of the the um, old dinosaurs in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned to some students who are here this uh, this morning, in 1964 the Vatican Council decided to do away with North American seminaries, high school seminaries, and so the class I was in. Uh, would, uh, would be done away with the year that I completed it. So for, for all those years, every time I would complete my freshman year, my sophomore, they would eliminate that class. I, and I took this personally for a long time that I was so terrible that they had to close the seminary <laughs> class. Usually if you don't do well or uh, if you don't fit well or whatever, uh, you just move on, uh, but you, you don't actually close the place behind you. And then I attended the College of Santa Fe uh, for a year before I was sent to the, the Josephinum, and uh, Pontifical College of Josephinum, and, and the College of Santa Fe closed. So I've had this, this terrible <laughs> sense that the way to doom a college is for Olivas either to, to, to attend it. Uh, I've also uh, spoken at a couple of colleges that have later shuttered, shuttered their doors. Do so, you know something that we don't know? I, I, I would like to say, though, that it's pretty clear to me that, that Notre Dame will survive or leave us. Uh, I, I'm pretty confident. Um, uh, in fact, I, I always have loved coming here because I have colleagues and friends here. And um, uh, I had several seminarian classmates who went to the seminary here. And uh, when I was at, uh, in Ohio uh, at the Josephinum, uh, we would come back and forth. We would actually play each other in basketball. We won three of those times. The Josephine's still around, so they're they're hanging in there just like um, Notre Dame. Um, well, what I and, and this will not surprise you. There are three things I'd like to share with you today. Everything, everything falls in threes for Catholics. It seems to me. One is to talk with you a little bit about my book, but that in fact I just was pleased. I, I sent the final draft in on Friday, and my uh, publisher sent me this wonderful, effusive email today uh, saying how much she loved it and, and, and so forth. She called it a deep dive. I've not really heard that term before, but I'm, I'm told that's a good thing. She did a deep dive on it. I think it means she read it. Uh, uh, it has taken me nine years. It's longer than any other books I've ever labored over because it started out as a birth announcement for the DREAM Act. I was confident. In fact, I said it in print, and I've had to retract it and swallow it, that uh, the fact that, that the DREAM Act was introduced in Congress in 2001 by Orrin Hatch on the right, my, my right, and uh, Dick Durbin on my left, and Ted Kennedy, assured that it would be enacted into law when people that broadly displayed over the political spectrum would both introduce it. Well, here it is now. It's never even been voted upon in the, in the Senate. Been voted upon twice in the House, um, and what started, what has started out as a birth announcement, uh, I am now rendering with an obituary. Uh, uh, 
uh, I would love to be wrong, and I would love for this book to come out and for everybody to say, we want the second edition of that book with what happened after Olivas turned it in. Um, but I've had too many false starts and too many um, uh, treasures I've chased and too many um, uh, sleepless nights trying to understand why we can't handle these wonderful students whom I adore and whom I've devoted much of my life to because I teach both higher ed law and immigration law. When Dreamers came along, it was like they were born for me. The intersection of higher education and immigration is, of course, what I do. Now, the, the entertainment law is stuff that I took up later just as a as sort of a, uh, uh, to have fun, and it's turned into something really serious. So I do workshops all the time with young musicians and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, this is the, the last uh, scholarly book that I, I will, that I have in the works. And uh, uh, what I wanted to do today was to pull out one of the chapters that I thought might be most of interest. So the three things I want to talk about are the, how there's three narratives in search of resolution. That's really what I want to talk about. Three narratives in search of resolution. And the first narrative is how the Dream Act and DACA came about and what they mean and what they've meant to these, these dreamers. I'm going to call them dreamers even though that's, not a, that's, that's sort of a, a nickname. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the architecture of how immigrants gain lawful work in the United States, or how they can gain work lawfully in the United States. That's the second narrative. And these, co these collide because a lot of these students have characteristics, legal characteristics, and some impediments uh, that are legal, uh, that are constructed, and that prevent them from um, uh, truly engaging with the talents that they will bring to bear on our workforce and our community. The good news is that I never thought I would ever be talking about the right to be a lawyer in California, even if you're undocumented. That's not documented, undocumented. Sergio Garcia, not to be confused with the golfer, um, the one that's dating Martina Hingis, I'm told by one of my nieces. Uh, uh, Sergio Garcia was too old for DACA, but they passed a law saying that he and others like him who are undocumented can, if they pass the bar and, and present moral character and fitness, they can actually practice law in the state of, of uh, California. In as much as about 40% to half of our undocumented uh, students are in California, that's an important uh, attribute. And then third, I want to talk about state, how state licensing works, because I think that a lot of people don't understand how licenses and occupations and, and all of the, the kind of characteristics that go into the credentialing of people. So these are the three narratives. And just very briefly about, about uh, uh, the DREAM Act and, and DACA itself. Since 1982, when the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, incidentally the year that I moved to Houston, and it was a Houston, at least in part of Houston case, Plyler versus Doe said that states could not charge um, tuition to children, no matter their status or the status of their parents, the legal status, um, and uh, that they had to they had to educate them. In fact, the truancy laws applied to them. All the while, the seven years or so that that case was going on, and I and I actually wrote a book just about Plyler called No Undocumented Child Left Behind, also available in fine bookstores everywhere. Uh, soon to be a major motion picture uh, with Jimmy Smith playing me. Um, because of the eerie resemblance uh, that we really have. Uh, uh, so after that, what happens when these Plyler kids who have all of these talents and who were brought here by their parents, who sacrificed and who live in the shadows for them, brought those kids here or had came here and then had citizen children as well, so even in mixed immigration families, and I know many, many of them, where the older kids are undocumented and the younger kids are U.S. birthright citizens, it turns out that they wanted to go to college just like everybody else did. They achieved in school. In fact, in, in one year, uh, part of my study, one year that uh, the city of Houston, which is the, uh, the fourth largest and about to become the third largest city in the country with one of the largest uh, school districts, over 220,000 students um, in that school district, and there's 18 school districts in the Houston area. So it's just one of many, but it's the largest. It turned out 
that uh, 17 of the high schools, either the first or the second student in class, that is the, the, the valedictorian or the salutatorian, was undocumented. That's an extraordinary concentration of talent. And what it showed was that these kids had opportunities and in school, and they thrived, even though their parents were always watching out for them and protecting them the way that our, our parents protected us, but even more so. And, and, uh, and then they would go to college, and college wouldn't be available to them. They were ineligible for financial aid. Uh, they would have to pay out-of-state tuition as if they were international students, which they weren't. Uh, in fact, they weren't even eligible to become international students because they were no longer living in their countries, and so they weren't eligible for F1 student visas the way that the international students have. So they were in this kind of limbo. And it's, a, again, a Catholic phrase that I use, uh, limbo or, or purgatory. Uh, although, Plyler says that, that while the parents may have been transgressive in coming across it, that these are innocent children, that these are children who came with their parents because the, the, uh, uh, the residence of the domicile of children is that of their parents until they're 18 or, or legally emancipated. And, and so they came, and this has morphed, this, this, this very generous Supreme Court case, which has never been challenged in another uh, Supreme Court uh, case, um, uh, has, has, is now the law of the land. Every state uh, abides by this, and, and they have worked out the, the, the proper implementation and the inculcation of this, and, and now uh, these, these uh, uh, kids don't have to live under quite the shadow that they used to when there was tuition being charged them. But it turns out that this narrative has demonized parents. Because if the children are innocent, then someone had to be the perpetrator. And in that narrative, it's the parents. And so for several years, we had DACA, which I will talk about in just a moment. But then when we had DAPA, which was to allow parents who had citizen children to have legal status, the world blew up and uh, court shut it down and uh, cut off uh, uh, advanced parole and uh, DACA was then on a death sentence that has been postponed only the way that all death sentences are because of good lawyering uh, where uh, there's now a number of cases that have, have stretched it out uh, with renewability for a number of years uh, if they were to actually officially properly shut it down tomorrow, it would still play on for a number of years until these uh, cases wound their way through. I don't think that's going to happen because, uh, frankly, I think that, the, that uh, there's the, the real issue is whether or not uh, a president has the authority to enact such a program or whether or not it was illegal from the beginning. Well, it's not illegal, and this administration just simply can't even shut down programs properly. They, they could have shut it down but they've chosen not to. They've simply uh, um, lawyered it badly, as they have with, with any number of things. And uh, as a result, it has continued, but it limps along, and it's not the answer. It was never the answer, because DACA never had an end game. It never had a pathway to citizenship or, or, or uh, to permanent residence. Uh, it turned out there were a couple of small loopholes that were exploited by some of these students, but cutting off advanced parole uh, even shut that down. So. I would say that these kids who have not, and I refer to them as kids because they're, I, I consider them my kids. My wife and I are each the oldest of 10, but we never had any children. But I consider all these documented kids mine. And I was on a phone call one time with about six of them, and we were trying to get a strategy. And I kept trying to tell them, don't go out yourselves. Don't go protest at Senator McCain's office. All you'll do is get arrested and you'll get deported, and then you're gonna call me at two in the morning saying, I know you were right, Professor Lewis, I'm, I, yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> so this one guy says, well, you're nothing but an old birthright citizen. And there was this huge intake of gasp of breath on the phone. All these, all these other kids said, you know, Professor Lewis is our friend. You can't talk to him like that. I said, that, that's all right. You know, just he doesn't get to call me if he's arrested. <laughs> so we, we set that up. Uh, 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 you, you, I, I love them, and I've dedicated my professional life to them. And, um, and yet, they are one administration away from having no options whatsoever. 
Um, but there's always hope, and that's another thing that being Catholic gives you, is the hope that good deeds will become uh, rewarded. Um, and uh, I, we, we all have to uh, act as if there's a tomorrow for them, because there is. And I'm confident that at some point we will all learn of a comprehensive immigration reform, at least with dreamers, because they're the easy ones. They have, we have their biometrics on file. They do not commit crimes. They're highly educated. They're all literate in English. They are in our country. They are our people. And we cannot remove 800,000 people. We just cannot do it. And lawyers will continue to throw their bodies in front of, of courts until this happens. And, and I, I think that at some point it will happen. It's just that I had to finish my book, and I've been trying to find positive uh, hope that this semester, this this term in Congress, it will be signed. There have been over 50 bills of Dream Acts over the years. There's four in Congress right now. Uh, they're not going to get a hearing as long as um, as long as the Senate is is formed the way that it is, and the House passing it is not going to do any good. Um, until there's a, a possibility of the, of the Senate enacting it. And so uh, we're sort of stuck in gear. Meanwhile, we got 800,000 students who've become documented. No new ones allowed either. So they both cut off the, the supply and they cut off the advanced paroles. You can't leave the country and come back, even for emergencies. Even if you're Alita sick, you can't leave. Even if you want to study in Salamanca, nope, you can't, can't leave the country and come back. You may have seen just last week, a, a documented flight attendant was flying a Mesa Airlines, which goes back and forth between Mexico and, and, and New Mexico and, and Mexico and a, and a few other states, and they wouldn't let her back in. And she said, well, I went to HR, to Human um, Resources, and they told me that I could, that it was okay, because I had DACA and I had right to work. They sent her out on this, on this flight, it employed her, knowing full well she couldn't come back in the United States without, without parole. And so she, she lucked out. She, she is married to a, to a U.S. citizen, so she will have an opportunity there. Love blooms a lot in immigration, let me just say. Uh, that's one of the great things about it. Uh, but, but more to the point, uh, she, she will now handle only U.S. flights because they dangerously and foolishly put her out there, even though she'd gone to them and asked, and they should have checked before, if you're going to hire people with international roots, you got to make certain that all you people are eligible, not just to, to leave the country, but to come back. And I think what had happened was that a lot of flight attendants and pilots go through special processing for, for airports. And I think, because she, she'd been coming back and forth for several months, even though she was ineligible, and I think it just finally caught up with her at, at some point, uh, which again shows the kind of sort of Damocles that hangs over, over these folks. So the DREAM Act in DACA, um, uh, DACA was, was proposed in, in uh, 2012. Uh, at first, I was against it because I thought, you're asking for a lot of information from these people with no guarantee that they'll have employment. And uh, then it turns out, because they had said at first, you'll have to have uh, special, uh, exceptional, extreme, unusual hardship, the, the ad adverbs on that. And, uh, and of course, all of them do. but. They, they were not giving work authorization. Well, then it deci they decided to give it to everybody. So all 800,000 get three things in particular. They get social security numbers, so they can pay into the system. They get employment authorization. And most importantly, they get, and I just know some of you in the room know this very well, they also get lawful presence. I want you to remember that term. Lawful presence means the time they're here now doesn't count against any ineligibility. They have permission to remain here until they don't. And they can renew it for two years as long as the program lasts. And they're continuing to do so, and most of them have done so. Um, and they still get authorization. They still get to pay into Social Security. They no longer get uh, uh, advanced parole, as I mentioned. Uh, but they get lawful presence, which is not the same as lawful status. Lawful status means that you've got legal permission to be in the United States and you can eventually become a permanent resident. That's not what they have. They've got legal presence. And this is, again, why terminology matters. 
And what particularly matter in the chapter that, or in the, the, the piece I'm going to talk to you about next, which is the architecture of immigrants, employment, and family. Other than coming in as refugees, or there's a small program every year for, for, for a, a lottery, believe it or not, a lottery. Um, I passed six casinos, and all I could think of was, you know, got the immigration lottery uh, where you take your chances. And of course, it's for countries, by the way, that are undersubscribed. If you're Mexican, Dominican, Chinese, Indian, etc., oversubscribed countries, countries where there's where there's a waiting list, you aren't eligible. We have this perverse system where a diversity lottery is to help people from Ireland and other kinds of places that are underrepresented. Uh, so go figure. Um, it was actually President or, uh, Senator Kennedy's idea, and he did it largely to help Irish come here, who had no other way of coming here. But if you think of the people, if you're a Filipino and you've got a brother who's waiting in line for you to bring him in as a, as a fourth preference, that's a 17-year wait. If you want to bring your spouse and you're a permanent resident and your spouse is from Mexico, he or she will have these days, I haven't looked for this month, but almost a two-year wait to bring them in. There are waiting queues for oversubscribed countries, and yet we have a lottery for undersubscribed countries. Go figure. If I were Meadow Meadow for a day, immigration czar for a day, that, that'd be my first act is to, to undo that and make all dreamers citizens. That I would just take my wand and say, okay, here, <laughs> all, all of you, like sprinkling holy water. On all of you. The architecture of immigration means that in, you can come to the United States essentially through two ways, other than refugees, and I'm not talking about refugees for the moment. That's a completely different group. Um, you come either because you have a family connection or because of employment. And there are limitations, particularly on, on uh, coming here as a permanent resident, but an awful lot, and, and every year uh, there are about uh, half a million or so People that come here as permanent residents, and if you're, uh, and there's some that are, you can speed up the categories. Like you can bring, if you're a citizen, you can bring uh, your spouse and uh, immediate family and children. And if you're 21, you can uh, at, you can get your parents here and so forth. So uh, that's why when I hear the term anchor baby, uh, that a child born here is going to convey advantages to the to the mother, I say Man, that is really clever because. They knew enough to be born in the United States so that 21 years from now, they can petition for their mother. Man, we, we need more people like that who are so smart before they're born uh, to arrange for being born in a certain kind of place. It just simply is counterintuitive, but it's, it's, the, it's, it's like reading Neruda or, or some other magical realist. You know, it, it's, a, it's a world that doesn't really exist, but it's so close to real life that it inspires you. And, so the architecture of immigration has always inspired me. And I would just say that the, the best way to understand this is that we have letters in the alphabet from A to B with non-immigrants. Non-immigrants are people who come here temporarily for a temporary reason, like uh, tourists or um, uh, certain uh, workers or people uh, or students. They come here until either the time expires, like you've got six months as a tourist and you can renew it once, but, uh, um, uh, which by the way is the source of most of our undocumented persons. So today, about uh, a third of the people who are undocumented, there's two ways to become undocumented. One is you cross the border surreptitiously. That's about a third of the people. The other two thirds came here legally, but then absconded. And because they either worked when they didn't have permission or they overstayed their visa or they moved without permission, they did something transgressive and they lost their status. Uh, not their presence necessarily. So from A to B, if your A is ambassador, it just happens to rhyme, so I always use it. So everybody, so my students think it's easy to remember them. Uh, the others don't really rhyme, except V for victims, that does. So the first one and the last ones actually stand for, uh, uh, they, they've managed to, to stand for something else. But some of these have employment authorization because you come here to work and some of them don't. Uh, so you can um, uh, freelance. Um, in some cases, uh, um, you can come here and look for work and then go back. 
Uh, in some cases, you may come under, say, an L, uh, a non-immigrant visa, which means you work for some company and uh, British Petroleum, and then they have an office in Houston, so they want to send you here. So they would come temporarily, and after six months, uh, they would move on to another place, or they would bring them in to do put out fires on a on a uh, um, an oil well or something like that. So there's that whole architecture is very focused, and uh, with the exception of one group, the H-1Bs, they're unlimited. We have um, about 30 million people a year who come and go on tourist visas. We don't, we don't issue 30 million. It's just that we issue millions, tens of millions, and people come and go for a whole year uh, on that. And in fact, if you're with a country like England, uh, Jimmy, you're in England, you don't even have to have a visa because we have a, a reciprocity arrangement where you can come and go, but you can't work. You couldn't go to England and work, and someone from England couldn't come here and work on a tourist visa. You're not allowed to do it. But you can come and you can look over colleges. You can be an M to study English in a, a technical school. You can apply for an F, which is a student visa. Afterwards, you can get optional practical training and curricular practical training, and then get a job that if they get an H-1B for you, and then if you work long enough, there might be a, a visa available to you. Uh, so there's a, an architecture of this. It all fits into place, and this is what immigration lawyers do, is we help find our clients' places, and that's just for the workers. And then they have families, of course, to bring along. So there's also family reunification. So if you come as a student, you can bring your family and your kids can go to public schools because they're subject to the truancy laws, but your spouse can't work. So there's limitations on almost all of these that, that you need to know, and you have to really abide by them because particularly today, they're, they're very fastidious about this. One time when I was associate dean for students, an uh, international student from, uh, I think it was from the Dominican Republic, uh, maybe in Costa Rica, I, I, but some Latin American country, uh, was, was a, an LLM student trying to get a master's degree in law. And we weren't going to offer a summer class. So I said, why don't you go over to Texas Southern and take it? It's about a mile away. They're offering it. We have the courses coordinated. Uh, we're not offering it because we knew they were. So he goes over and signs up and pays tuition. And uh, lo and behold, he didn't have permission. I, I, I sent this poor guy to his doom. So I, you know, I, I, I have confession. I like candles. Turns out the head of what was then called INS is a man who's a friend of mine who was the, the chair of the board of the University of Houston system. So I go to Eduardo and I say, Eduardo, I really screwed up. I didn't realize I had to have advanced permission. I thought I could take this class because it was just one class. He's still a student at the University of Houston and we have, a, we have an arrangement with them that they'll honor our classes and they'll, we'll honor theirs. He says, oh, mijo, he says, he says, no, we're going to have to take him out and shoot him. And I said, <laughs> I said don't joke. He says, well, I tell you what, I'll fix this, but you get one bite at the apple. One bite at the apple. I said, man, if I'd known I had a whole bite, I would have I done something worse than that. You know, <laughs> fixing this is nothing. He said, well, it's not nothing, but, but we're even now. He said, for all those times that you were nice to me and always paid, because he was really featured. It wasn't, it, wasn't like he, it wasn't like he still had his first communion money, but he knew where he had spent it. And he said, well, you're a big lawyer. You're a big-time lawyer. You buy. You know, so, well, it turned out uh, it worked out okay. But it just shows you how fraught with problems there are. And one small mess-up. There were some people who, because of the flooding in Houston, had to move, and they didn't report their new addresses derived from having to flee the floods uh, to, to uh, the immigration authorities, and then some, some notice was sent to them, and they found out, and they, they were sent to the back of the list, uh, to, of the line for this. I mean, they want to know where you are, and you can lose your, your uh, place in line, you can lose your status, and you have to be really careful. And this is what lawyers do, is they work with their clients to make sure this doesn't happen. So, Income in 2012, even though I thought it wasn't going to work out, I was wrong and I was glad to be wrong because I thought it was too big a bar, it was not a good enough bargain. 
Here these students were making themselves known to the government, which is a legal term, meaning they've got it, you got you in a file, and they were getting information, but all they were giving you was the permission to stay here. And because they weren't really prosecuting these kids anyway, it wasn't that much of a deal. Well, then it turns out, so security and, and uh, uh, employment authorization and more to the point, um, immigration pres lawful presence. So that's not nothing. That's a big deal. And they could live with that as long as there were, or they could live with it until they get permanent residence. So we've now gone through the DREAM Act and DACA to that point. It's being tied up in court. But uh, right now, we've won most of those cases. There's one case in, in Texas that didn't go our way. And it would have been proper. It, it went to the Supreme Court. And it was, it was a 4-4 tie because the Republicans would not give Merrick Garland uh, a hearing. Almost a year, and they wouldn't even give him a hearing, uh, much less a vote. And, and so when it goes to the Supreme Court, and, and having lost in the Fifth Circuit, um, uh, it was a 4-4 vote, and so it, it simply got remitted back to the trial court. And this, this judge had what I consider to be sort of a conversion. He, he said, well, the egg has been cracked, and I'm not going to, and, and we've had 800,000 students, and I'm not going to be the one to sort of uh, spoil their lives. Uh, Congress has to act on this. He sort of threw his hands up. But it's still, because a number of states, including Texas, have, have uh, sued, it's now back on the docket, and it's being challenged again. And it will go to the Supreme Court. And, and, and now uh, I just don't know how the vote will go on that. I, I, I don't pretend to know. But I'm hopeful that as these things move, that those, those kids will still have time, because each of them has two years unexpired on an extension, that at some point that might force their hand. But what if it doesn't? What if we just simply are at such an impasse and with administration that, that, that is premised upon walling off and, and demonizing Mexicans in particular, uh, uh, I, I just, we're, we're all bad hombres showing how they use bilingual education. Uh, I'm going to wait for that to wash over the room. <laughs> So I want to, what I want to do in the time remaining, and then I want to let you all ask some, some questions. Um, like, why did Prince die without a will? Or <laughs> how could Aretha die without a will? I mean, these are questions that I want to answer. Um, so all of a sudden, we've got all these students, 800,000 who are moving forward, and they're becoming teachers, and, and they're, they're working in, in licensed professions. Uh, and so I decided to do a, a national study where I pulled together the, the national data on the application process and the admissions process to five post-secondary, uh, post-baccalaureate high-level professions. So uh, lawyer, doctor, um, uh, in, Indian chief, um, um, and uh, teacher and educational psychologist and, and so forth. So, and then I looked, I pulled up five states where most of these uh, folks are, and I looked much more deeply. Uh, New York, for example, has, has over 1,500 licensed professions. And I looked at the immigration status, the immigration requirement of each of those, and I found that this is an area that's seriously in need of reform, shall we say, because no one ever expected that you're going to have DACA students, documented students, who can present credentials to become lawyers or doctors. Because they, they were DACA deferred action had always been used as sort of an emergency placeholder for someone who was about to be deported or who uh, was here for medical reasons, and so they, they were here temporarily. But they, they didn't go to school. They certainly didn't go to school in these large numbers that these talented kids, having been accorded places in school by Plyler, were continuing to grow. And we would have another 200,000 today if it hadn't been cut off in 2015, uh, when, when uh, 2016, the tail end. So when the administration decided to shut it down. So I've chosen um, uh, just, just three, again, following my count nature, to share with you. Now, remember I told you that the three things that people with DACA have are 
lawful presence, social security numbers, and employment authorization. So I began to look at the kinds of requirements, particularly the immigration related requirements. And so here's, let's take lawyers just as an example, since there are a few in the room. I'm just gonna take the first four in the alphabet. So Alabama, only a person who's a citizen of the United States, or if not a citizen of the United States, a person who is legally present in the United States with the appropriate documentation may be licensed to practice law. Who would have thought? I'm pretty sure the people in Alaska or in Alabama didn't do that to help DACA. It's just that DACA broadened itself and broadened its reach that these folks now can enter practice. Alaska. The application shall be made under oath and contain such information relating to the applicant's age, residence, etc., etc. However, the application must contain the applicant's social security number. Well, who would have thought? They thought that was just like information gathering. It turns out that's an eligibility requirement. If you can provide a social security number, you are eligible now. And why did they think that was okay? Well, because no one who was undocumented before had a social security number that was their own. They might have had an ITIN, an international number, um, taxation identification number. Um, Arizona. If a U.S. citizen, a copy is required, a birth certificate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a completed I-9 or certificate of natural, I-9 is employment authorization. If not a citizen, Copies of official documentation of immigration status. Well, think about that for a moment. I gotta just give them permit, gotta give them reference. So that, that's DACA, here's my immigration. This is a particularly inconsistent requirement because the technical eligibility language, not a citizen of the United States, covers an awful lot of immigration categories. It's unclear how far that goes. Moreover, it is illegal to occasion benefits and occupations on being a citizen when there's no legal distinction between being a citizen and a permanent resident. And there's a whole series of cases that are about financial aid eligibility and so forth that say if you've got permanent residence, then you are eligible for whatever citizens have. Not voting and so forth, but with regard to benefits, which is what we're talking about. Arkansas. Candidates must be maybe a United States citizen, an alien lawfully admitted for permanent residence, or an alien otherwise authorized to work or study lawfully in the United States. Thank you, Arkansas, and et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's many more of these, and, and I, so I just want to switch to medical school because here, law schools, they continue to, you know, there's no sort of limitation on the number of, of lawyers that we can produce every year. Uh, I know some people think we don't, we, we produce way too many. I, I personally think we don't produce enough because the need for lawyers is still very great. We have a, a terrible mismatch uh, between the need and the availability of lawyers. But be that as it may, with regard to doctors, there's, they have, they've only built one new medical school and now another one at the University of Houston. Only two medical schools in the last 10 years. This is not an area that's growing and it's very practice oriented, that is, you determine early on where, where you're going to have your residency and, and uh, the licensing is very tight for this. And even if you even are overdue on student loans, some states will not let you sit for, for becoming a, a doctor. Uh, so it's, it's much tighter. But look at West Virginia. I'm going to take the last four in the alphabet. In order to comply with federal law, it's obligated to, to inform each applicant or license licensee from whom it requests a social security number that disclosing such number is mandatory all caps in order for this board to to comply with the requirements of the federal national database etc etc so their one requirement you present all the application material in the the classes but social security number wisconsin there's no specific immigration status but the application requires in a, either an, a social security number or an ITIN on it. And it also says, under oath, I declare that I am a check one, 
citizen or national of the United States or a qualified alien or non-immigrant lawfully present in the United States who's eligible to receive this professional license. It's circular. If you're eligible to receive it, then you get it. If you have lawful presence. Um, Wyoming shall require applicants to include the applicant's social security number on the application form. What is this fixation with social security numbers? Well, that used to be the means of determining who's eligible to work because to get a social security number, you had to be authorized to work. So it became a proxy. But they never tightened it up when it turned out 800,000 people all of a sudden have these new social security numbers. They go on like this. Well, so what are we, what are we left with? Well, a number of states didn't even ask questions of your immigration status. There are 30 states that have no mention of immigration whatsoever on their application forms. It's probably just assumed you can be at least a permanent resident or a citizen, or we've put down enough road hurdles here that you're going to have to drive around. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll hit you with one of them. Well, it turns out they've got all three that I've mentioned are included in here as, as options. And sometimes they'll ask for information even though it's not tied to the requirement. So they'll ask for a social security number even in a state that doesn't require it. Now these kids can say, well, okay, here's my social security number, I give it to you. But it's not that they require it, it's just they put it on the form. So sometimes there's a gap with the form. But a number of states, I'll say Oregon and California is two that are, are prominent, never used to ask this question. There was, there is a dream bar association where former dreamers, some of them have now become citizens, but, but not all of them, including Sergio Garcia, by the way, has now become a citizen. So he was a lawyer in, in, uh, in California, even though he did not have DACA. But it's still now law, it was passed for him, but anybody else could drive through that. It's just hard to imagine someone who doesn't have DACA, who can go to law school, pass the bar, pass the moral character and fitness, and then present credentials. It, it's the, the, the strength of character and the, the hard work and the headwinds blowing against these kids. It just amazes me that they could do any of it. I, I know a lot of birthright citizens who are knocked off their schedule of, of going to law school simply because it's too hard or they decide, oh, halfway through, I thought it was going to be cool. It's not cool. Um, obviously not taking my classes. <laughs> and they, they fall off the wagon, and they're no longer, you know, they're, they become paralegals or something, which is perfectly fine, but it's not the same as being a lawyer. So um, California didn't ask for it until this one dreamer, and I begged him not to do it. I begged him not to go public, but he said, you know, I've been talking with this New York, with an LA Times reporter, and, and, and she wants to talk to me about taking the bar and how I can take the bar if I'm undocumented. I said, please don't, please don't talk to her. Well, he did, and of course, then he fails the bar. There is karma in this world. He, he failed the bar, and then they started asking the question. So there were a bunch of people before that time who had gotten because they didn't ask the question, we were never disqualified. So sometimes it's simply by inattention. Sometimes it's by accident. Sometimes it's just the way that these happen. And, and of course, one state will look at another state and they'll pass these forms around. There's a national, uh, you know, uh, through the ABA and, uh, and other groups that, that have this, uh, that meet, as well as bar examiners, which is really where the action is. And, and so, uh, there are states that have had dreamers for years, uh, and uh, uh, some of them have had multiple dreamers over the years. A couple of states have now sort of caught on and they've tightened up some of these gaps here. But I would argue that, that fully in half the states, uh, documented students uh, and graduates who pass the bar, who, who have no moral character and fitness hits on them, and no, no DWIs, those kinds of things that normally disqualify you. And they're, they're eligible to sit and practice as, as lawyers. Now, interestingly, the people who opposed, in, in California, who opposed 
the state's changing its law to allow the undocumented uh, to practice was the Obama administration. And I, I never quite understood this. I think it was the Department of Justice. And I, I've never had a chance to talk with Holder about this. Next time I see him, I'm going to ask him why he did. But uh, he, he, he opposed it. And so you can't, ironically, you, can, you can't be, in, if you're undocumented, you still can't work in California. But hanging out a shingle doesn't constitute employment because it is self -employed. it's self-employed. You are a contractor. So you couldn't work for a law firm, couldn't work for, for uh, you know the, the city of, of uh, um, South Bend. Uh, you could not work for the, for the attorney general's office, but you could hang out a shingle, and you can become an LLP uh, and a, a leap. And, and I might add, a number of really smart dreamers have over the years hung out shingles as um, uh, teachers. They bartered uh, their way. They're ineligible for federal funds, but now nine states, uh, including the largest ones, Texas and, and California, allow financial aid. You can take out a loan if you're undocumented in California. Take out a loan for school. The, the world, and, and mind you, back in, in the 1990s, Proposition 187 was considered the, the strictest restriction on immigration and uh, uh, it even though Maldiff was in there and we managed to strike down most of the most of the uh, the issues on it uh, it was still on the books um, and Pete Wilson was the Donald Trump of his time he was running he was mayor of at least he knew what he was talking about he was he was mayor of, of San Diego and he he was against undocumented immigration and he said so but he lost he never was the national campaigner he, he, he lost to of all people, Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan in 1986 enacted the Immigration Reform and Control Act. This famously conservative person acted in a way that surprised everybody because we had moderates like uh, Senator McCain who was working on it and, and we passed Immigration Reform and Control Act. I would have taken that bet that I was, I had given up on that. And, and it, it was enacted and, and then uh, that gave legalization to a lot of people. So we're back to ground zero now. And I have to believe that at some point, all the, the worlds are going to converge. All the moons are going to be in Jupiter. And we're, it's, it's all going to work. I just have to believe this because I'm a person of faith. And I think that there's so many reasons to do it and so few not to do it. And the ones that are not to do it are mostly nationalistic and nativist and frankly racist in many instances. Um, so uh, I'm going I'm to leave it there, even though there's a lot more to unpack that I, I'd be glad to, to do so. But uh, I want to give you some time to, to uh, ask questions. Now, that didn't mean I got answers to them. So I got the answers. So let's see if you got the right questions. <coughs> okay? uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I'd be glad. And whatever is said in here stays in here, okay? I don't want anybody running out and turning in anybody, okay? So. We have about 30 minutes for questions. Okay, uh, I'm gonna start with you, yes sir. And Mr. Thank, Martinez, right? Yes, Professor yeah. Leo, yeah. thank you, and it's a privilege. Um, from a legal standpoint, what happens to attacks on DACA recipients, particularly um, given the three provisions that they have yeah. and if they try to uh, strip away those provisions? Well, DACA is, has been enjoined as it is. So with the exception of new ones, so they enjoined offering new ones, but they wanted to undo, just let them all expire. Sort of like the Civil Wars veteran, you know, Widow's Fund, where they, eventually they're all going to die. Uh, they, uh, so the, it continues, but the number shrinks, in part because some people get tired, some people do run afoul. Some folks have left the country and tried to get back in and they can't. There's people like this, like this flight attendant who might, who was in jail for six, in detention for six weeks until it finally worked itself out. Um, I, I don't think, I think that the program itself is intact as it is, but it's frozen in time with no new ones. So there's no new blood. Uh, it's not, uh, and, and there's still, it can be taken away from you, and, but you still have all the privileges. You can still uh, reapply. Uh, you still have employment authorization. 
We've sued at least three or four employers who didn't recognize <coughs> DACA because they said, well, you're only going to have it for a short period of time. Well, employment authorization is employment authorization. Once you have it, you're eligible. And so we, we've won certain nationwide insurance and, and a couple of other co companies have said, look, why should we invest in these people only to have them expire? Well, you lose workers all the time. I mean, hiring is, is a continuous process. And anybody who has any experience in the area knows that people can, can change. You can, they can lose their law license for other kinds of reasons, not just, not just immigration related. And the thing is, these, these students have every reason to stay compliant with all the laws. Because if they don't, the government knows where they are and can remove them. <coughs> And I'm not trying to threaten them, but I'll never forget, Tina and I one time were driving, we used to live really close, we now live on campus, we used to live uh, about a mile away. And one morning we drove in, and right in front of a school, there were two cars that had an accident. So we stopped to look, and there's not a person there. They had all fled the scene. Now what does that tell you had happened? They were undocumented. They didn't have licenses because Texas won't allow them to have driver's licenses. So they work and stick around and, and sort of you know tell the police what happened. He did it. No, he did it. Yeah. <laughs> so they are frozen in time, but it's a good space as long as the time remains. It's, if, if, if it ever ends, if the ice age comes, then there's going to be a real problem. And as I say, it's going to be a political fight, not a legal fight. Yes? So once your book is published, and Steve King reads it, Congressman from Iowa. Yeah. Is there going to be this backlash? Is he says, oh my goodness, oh my God, I had no idea that these <laughs> licensing regulations permit DACA students to get licenses here, so we're going to have to. Yeah, I don't know that they do in Iowa. Uh, but, uh, and, I, and I, frankly, I always assume that the rules are there for everybody to read, and the fact that I'm reading them should benefit me and my clients and the people for whom I'm advocating. But I, I can't hide truth from these folks. Uh, I, I, I think this is pretty much below his radar in the sense that he could have acted, spoken out against this a long time ago. And um, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything that wasn't publicly available. It's not like I'm putting this stuff into the public record. This is, I took this from public records. If he were really interested in this, by the way, I'd be flattered to think that Peter King read my stuff. You know, I, I don't, I'm not sure he does read. <laughs> uh, is my answer. Yes, sir. Do these DACA owners of those three points, can yeah. they work their way towards citizenship? They, they, not, there is, DACA itself has no provisions for becoming a permanent resident. But why not? That, well, because it was always intended, well, because it was always intended, well, because President Obama did not have the authority to create a whole new category of permanent resident eligibility. That has to be done by Congress. What he did was he decided, I'm, I'm only going to, I'm not going to go after jaywalkers. I'm not going to go after pedestrians who walk too fast on the sidewalk. I'm only going to go after felons. I mean, prosecutorial discretion is what he was using. And every, every for, uh, you know, administration uses it. Your office uses it to decide what crimes you're going to go after. Who are you going to defend? Wh which ones? This year we're going to really go after um, uh, spousal abuse because it, it's turning out to be much more serious than we thought. And so we're going to pay attention. And that's our first call. Doesn't mean we're going to ignore everything else, but we're going to really pay attention. Or if someone's called, there will be a report, even if the, sp the spouse who's, who's being battered says, I don't want to report it. You take that out of the equation, right? From now on, we're always, if you're called to a place and there's a spouse meeting, we're going to report it, we're going to act on it. Even if you don't press the charges on it. Once you've done it, it's out of your, it's out of your control. I mean, that, that's prosecutorial discretion. You decide you're going to do that. They just decided they weren't going to go after these kids. And these kids were having these marches, and they were coming public, and they were embarrassing uh, senators showing up in their offices and sitting there with, I mean, they, had, they knew protest, and they knew how to, they grew up in the U.S., they know how to protest the way that all of us grow up learning how to do that. You get profiled. Well, I'm not sure they got profiled in the sense that they were asking for it. This is what I was begging them not to do. Right. 
Yeah. I, so, they, they came to the attention of authorities. So, and, and you can't, put, it's, it's like these students of mine who come in with these neck tattoos and then they want to go work for a white shoe firm. Or, or they show themselves uh, at the beach with a bong and they put it on Facebook. And then they realize Vincent and Elkins can read Facebook. You know, what the heck? They don't do this stuff. Now, I was a kid once, of course, I was in the seminary, so I'm mostly stealing community wine, you know. But, but the point is that, that they've gotten more savvy the more transgressive and out, out in the front people are. And, but this is why I love these students, because they don't care. They're not doing it for them, themselves. They're doing it for the larger group, and they really feel that they're blessed, and they're, it's, it's so unlikely they're going to be returned, they think. But they do. They will get returned to where they're from. And I, I, it breaks my heart whenever that happens. I think one of us dies whenever that happens. And So how can you, as a lawyer in this practice, help that group become citizens? Well, I can't. I, there, there's no way for them to become citizens right now. There's two small loopholes that they could exploit. They, they could, in fact, marry a U.S. citizen, but there's the Immigration and Marriage Fraud Amendments, and it's not automatic that they will be able to do that. They can leave the country with advance parole and come back, but that's been taken away from them. That was a, a small loophole that resulted in 30,000 of them realizing we kept it, we always kept it on the down low because we didn't want that to become known because the kings of the world would have, but a judge, this judge who was trying to shut the program down, drew his attention to that, came to the attention of the authorities. And, and again, it's these really savvy kids who, you know, word spread on the underground, and so some of them began to use it. They've taken that away. So I would say right now there are no legitimate options for them um, if, they, if they've been here so long that uh, they have accumulated what will trigger the three-year or the 10-year ban. If you've stayed here in undocumented fashion, not DACA, but undocumented fashion, for more than a year, more than 366 days, um, you're, you're uh, uh, banned from re-entering the country for, for either three years or 10 years, depending on how long you've been here. That, that is, it's cruel. It, and it came back, it came in 1996 when uh, Gingrich took over the House, and that was one of the laws that they passed, the President um, Clinton signed it into law because he thought it could, could have been worse. It could have been worse. But the high water mark turns out to be 1982 with Plyler and then 1986 with Immigration Reform and Control Act, which gave us employer sanctions, by the way, for the first time. Before that, all the onus had been on the, on the immigrants, not on the employers. Now, employers themselves can be, can be um, um, uh, convicted, uh, tried and convicted for this. And it happens all the time. So I, the answer is immigration reform or the DREAM Act becoming law. That, that's really the only long term. I think you should run for that office <laughs> well, instead of retiring. <laughs> that, that office? I, I, you know, that, that's the Senate and the House. Yeah. By the way, there is a vacancy in the Senate in New Mexico, in New Mexico as it happens. But uh, yes. Um, speaking to that point, number one, thank you very much for coming today. Um, but number two. Uh, what is your dream look for an immigration reform bill, and what's the likelihood of that happening on the docket post 2020? Well, it depends on what happens in 2020. Um, <laughs> by the way, they did move this out, and I will always hold President Obama. Well, I refuse to call him the what was the term? The porter in chief. The porter in chief. I, I've always refused to to use that because I understood he was trying with a number of issues, including uh, an employment that was dreadful, the economy was dreadful, to try and get health care, to try and get banking reform. All those things were important. But immigration, 
got lost in that shuffle. And that was the chance where they could have done that. Uh, because there's always enough Republican votes to pick up at the edges. And um, maybe, maybe not today, but at, at the edges. And and they had the, the Senate. And it was veto-proof. And I, I will always regret the one that got away. They didn't even vote on it in the Senate during that period of time. They voted on the House, but not in the Senate. And it, it's the one that got away. And I have... I have done everything I can that's legal to to implore these people through all the avenues I have available and I will say that that I was one of several people who, who wrote the president and and urged doc a form of DACA and he did that and I'll always be grateful for that but at the end of the day it doesn't get us anywhere other than but, but think what could have been worse I mean this, this is also a very Catholic way of looking at it. It could have been so much worse. <laughs> what would those 800,000 kids be doing, including people in this room, if they didn't have DACA? You think they'd be out making this argument, presenting credentials for, to become lawyers and teachers and so forth? There are thousands of teachers now in California who are DACA. I, if I ever had a legal issue concerning my immigration status, who would I go to? I'd go to Sergio Garcia. I mean, this is the guy who lived it. Who, led courageously at a time he could have been deported and he did it and he did it against all the odds and, and there were hundreds of, of lawyers who organized that effort to get them to change the law for him. Florida now allows documented, New York allows documented, not through law but through administrative, because every state has a different kind of way to change the practice. In some states uh, it's, it's a, a bar association, some states it's a state government, in some cases it's the state uh, Supreme Court. Uh, the jurisdictions are, are very different. There's, there's 51 of these out there, plus Puerto Rico, 52, and uh, they're all different. And you've seen how that can be advantageous, too, because if this were, what if this were all national and then they cleaned up those loopholes? There, there'd be no alternative. So the fact that, that you can make end runs and, and center plunges and then you can you know, there's all kinds of ways to shuck your way through. Uh, I find advantageous. That's what lawyers do is we try and find ways to help our clients or our issues. Uh, yes, it may put people on notice. I'm, I'm willing to do that because it helps. My, my view is it's going to help a lot more people. And, and it would be hard to go back and change some of these rules because it works fine. It's not like we're flooding the, the, the courts with a whole bunch of docu documented lawyers. You know, we're talking maybe dozens right now, maybe more. I've had four research assistants over time who've been undocumented. Um, um, and I, and I, I've lost, sort of lost track. I know sort of generally where they are. They're, they're working as paralegals um, now. Um, uh, it's, this is not a good situation. We've been going at it way too long. What would my, if I were czar for the day, I would, there's a, a rule called registry. If you're undocumented now, and you've been in the United States since 72, you're eligible no matter what, as long as you don't have felonies. So as long as you're not ineligible, you, you can become eligible for, for permanent residence. But those people have been squeezed out. I mean, there, there's almost no one that doesn't know about this. This is usually some abuelita in Brownsville who crossed over years ago and nobody paid attention. And it turns out she's undocumented. But she's been here forever, so they, you know, that's down to about a dozen people a year who could take advantage because it just tailed off. 72, that was the year I graduated from college. Here I am retiring. That was a long time ago. That could be advanced. Say we move that to 2012. If you've been here since 2012, pick a, pick a year. I consider this line drawing. Let's say 10 years. Been here, if you've been here 10 years, and you've not committed a felony, we will forgive you. You pay a fine, you have to go through the process. There's a, a what's called temporary, just like it was for the legalization, where you're in temporary uh, status for about a year, and then, you, then you're eligible for permanent residence. That, that's what I would do. And that would clean up an awful lot of these folks. I would make automatic, dreamers autom automatic, unless they've, done something to lose their status, uh, but they haven't. There's, there's no more than, like, I understand two, three dozen who've ever lost it. And I think it's, some of them just sort of gave up the fight. You know, it's, it's really hard. And of course, now the government has the information, and a lot of these kids, of course, live with their parents. 
so they know where your parents are. And even though there was an interagency agreement that the information wouldn't be shared across uh, agencies, it's hard for me to believe. Now when they want to you know, ask immigration questions on the census and so forth, of course, what do lawyers do? We throw down sand. So while that we pitched a bunch of sand in that process, and it's, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think they are going to be able to do that. Um, we've, we've never had to be as creative or had so many fights to fight as we do today. When the national narrative is, and, and it continues at these rallies, these nationalistic rallies, these bad hombres. Someone ought to tell him it means mal. You know, he, I, if he's going to use hombres, he's going to use mal. Uh, or we're caravans. There's no caravans. He's ruined a perfectly good Van Morrison song. <laughs> Caravan, one of the great Van Morrison songs. The reason we've got people lining up here is because we've separated families, children, including losing 3,000 of them, including two of them dying on our watch. Because uh, in the past, when you came here with a legitimate claim, until it was t determined to be illegitimate, you were allowed in the United States. And, and, and then there are refugee resettlement groups that help you resettle, and it, it worked. It w wasn't perfect, and it helped the advantaged, and it helped people from certain countries, but it, it was still mejor que nada. It was much better than nothing. It was much better than what we have now, where now they've got to go wait in, in Tijuana, or in Ciudad Juarez, or in, in, in Matamoros. And what are they going to do? We don't, have, we don't know how to serve. How do you get to serve papers to them? You know, these kids come up here armed with a telephone number in their heads and to call a family if they, get, if they get through. What we're doing is it's against not only all decency, it's against our own laws. It's against international law. We are members of treaty organizations that have signed laws saying that people get to raise claims for if there's, unless they're completely spurious and and, and it's evident beforehand. They get a hearing. They get notice and a hearing. And we had a system that worked for years. It didn't work perfectly. And there are countries that do it better than we do, like Canada, because they get fewer people coming to Canada. But what are people doing now? There are people who hop on flights because it's cheaper to get a flight to Canada, and they're coming in across northern borders. Which we don't, which are longer, by the way, than southern borders, and which we don't defend. How how can that happen? How do we get in such a place where all we're interested in is stopping Mexicans and people who uh, today uh, uh, Fox News reported that the president is not going to give money to three Mexican countries. <laughs> three now they're up to three. <laughs> he didn't even mean Mexico. He meant he meant. <laughs> Central America. <laughs> it, it, how did we get to this point? And there, there's a strong number of people for whom that resonates because they're convinced that they lost jobs due to Mexicans. I don't remember ever knocking someone out of a job. And the jobs that they do are not jobs that people in the United States want to do. Like marry presidents. <laughs> it, it is, it's wrong it's wrong that uh, and I can only joke about this because I'm so close to crying you know I've uh, plus this is my last lecture and so what the hell uh, yes. one last question yeah. Richard please. you talked about some of the things that could bring attention to a DACA recipient where they lose the status if they commit a crime if they go on public assistance which they're not allowed to do right. if they're not keeping their address current do you think there's anything based on past immigration uh, precedent that could enhance the chances? For example, I would think that a DACA kid is working in as an emergency room nurse. There's there's going to be more of a need for that kind of person than I don't know. Maybe someone who's working as an assembly worker, for example. I'm not putting a value on that. I'm just yeah. saying that. Do you think there are things that can there's nothing built? There's nothing baked, Richard. There's nothing baked into DACA that values one over the other. You know, that, that might be an argument to be made if someone were outside the United States and were applying for a job and went and had employment authorization or it was a job that conveyed that, like an H-1B 
uh, could or, or, or so forth. And there, there are ways to do that, but it would require these people to re-roll, replay, you know, like a movie, you know, you play it back. I've got, I've got this thing on, on Netflix that helps me go back if I miss something. It would require replaying their whole life. They've been here. They've already got, they've already got deportability uh, that's been suspended for this period of time. Now, I'm not, please don't, please understand, I'm not arguing in favor of that. I'm just saying that's the way that that is. And it is a blessing that we've had 800,000 go through on the first, the first wave who got to keep it and who've been so productive. And that is an object lesson. And by the way, they've become doctors and lawyers and, and assembly workers and uh, you know uh, nurses and and all the require these these folks are our folks. <laughs> they are our folks, and and we've invested in them. Why would we want to remove them to one of the three Mexicos? <laughs> it, it just it just it boggles the imagination. And immigration has no way to self-correct. It can only be corrected through prosecutorial discretion, which they used to do this in the first place, but it's only temporary. And frankly, as long as you're the prosecutor, it's your discretion. Someone else comes in, they change the discretion. They say, well, you know, the problem is if you leave little things undone, uh, like jaywalking, pretty soon you're going to be doing the hard stuff. You know, marijuana or, or something. So you decide to start going after jaywalkers. Well, that would die pretty soon because you're going to lock up all these little ladies and all these kids who outrun them. And, and it turns out it's a nothing burger. Sorry to all the vegans in the room. It's a nothing <laughs> burger. But it, it's, it's the way we, I have a theory that, that uh, if we get rid of small crimes, then people will respect big crimes. So we always bust them on the corner. If they're on a street corner, we go shake them down. Uh, if they're... Uh, Hang around, sort of look at Mexican, go go in there, check them out, and so forth. There, there's crimes of looking like you're Mexican or black. Uh, it's 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 just a, it's a time that we're going to have to get through. It will not do credit to our nation. It will be seen as an outlier, and I think that there will be blowback. I just have to believe that. I I can't keep soldiering on. If I don't believe this will will correct itself, and um, and I believe that it will because I do believe in the deep reservoir of immigration solidarity. Unless you're Native American, you came here from somewhere else, including my people came here from somewhere else. And it's true they may have done it many years ago, but the I, I hear conservative colleagues who say, you know, my mother was from Poland, my grandmother, my great grandmother was from Poland. And she had to wait until her turn came. I said, there was never a line for us to keep out Polish people. Polish people can walk up and present themselves. Or, I'm against chain migration. Who are the most recent recipients of chain migration? Melania's parents. I'm against chain migration as long as it's for thee and not for me. So, I think that we have to keep pointing fingers. I think we have to engage in a narrative that is not going to make us popular. I think some of us have to throw our bodies on the barbed wire so those can pass over. I think that we have to be generous with, with immigration groups to give them the resources that they need. I think that we need to help these students in ways that we can. It may be that, that they're, you know, I urge them to study as much as possible. And so we do everything we can to help them with scholarships and to buy their books and to get foundations to make available things. We, we started a DACA clinic at the University of Houston, the very first one in the country. We've helped thousands of these students through workshops and, and so forth. Each of us has to serve, like Dylan said, we all got to serve somebody. And, and I think that the way that you serve is by picking what you can do and then getting others who feel like you do to help. And those of us who are fortunate enough to live in this great country have a obligation, especially those of us who identify with the groups that are being harmed. If I were Jewish, I would, I would absolutely be fighting for more Jews to come here. 
I would be, if I were Filipino, I would absolutely believe in family. Some people want to do away with family migration. Just let everybody come on their own. I don't, I don't think I want to do that. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe in the lottery. I would do away with it, and I'd use those 50,000 places to help clear out the backlog of people who are, are, have already gone through the system. The problem is, if you're from certain countries, I might add non-white countries, the lines are so long that even when you do it, you're resting in line until the term comes, until your turn comes. And every, every month they publish data showing when, it's, when, when that group is going to be processed. And I, I've had clients who've been in line for six, seven, eight years with permission. And by the way, when that happens and you're in another country, if you're in the Philippines and you're a Filipino and want to bring your brother and he's got 17, they aren't going to let him come in the country separately because they're afraid he will abscond and disappear. And why do they believe that? Because that happens a lot. That's the way that people become undocumented. So they come in legally and then they disappear. Um, it's not a good system. It's not even a half good system, but it's what we've got. And I, I know that uh, I'm going to end there. I'll be glad to stick around if people have questions. Thank you all very much. I loved all of you. Don't report me to the authorities because this is my last talk. So <laughs> you got to me some slack. Uh, consistent with the theme that you started with, thank you for blessing us with your last lecture. Thank you. Thank you all very much.